Hey there, it's Kyle discussing 16 geographic oddities and quirks in the U.S. This is a huge country, but a lot of it follows kind of a uniform or predictable geography, but there are several places in this country that really don't follow the rules. Some of these are pretty odd, some are kind of quirky, and some are just kind of like, hmm, really kind of stuff? And you may have heard of some of these, you might be familiar with some of this stuff, and others you might not have heard of, and this isn't a countdown. I'm not going to be like, oh, this one's crazier than the next one kind of thing. It's just kind of going over some unique aspects of American geography. I live in Tennessee, so I'm going to start off with one about Tennessee. It's one of the strangest shaped states in the country. And one of the quirks about the state is that if there were two people in Bristol at the eastern end of the state, one started driving north toward Detroit, one started driving west towards Memphis, the one driving north would be in Canada before the one driving west would be in Memphis. So just with how wide the state is, it's not a huge state in terms of total area, but because of the strange shape, it really does go really far east to west. And that's a good segue to the second one. And that's if you are in Detroit and you want to go to Canada, you'll have to drive south. The southwestern corner of Ontario extends to kind of just southeast of Michigan. So if you want to head to the Great White North from Detroit, you got to head south. Something else that's quirky is that the highest point in the contiguous U.S. is Mount Whitney at over 14,400 feet. And the lowest point in the U.S. is Badwater Basin and Death Valley National Park, which is almost 300 feet below sea level. And why this is so quirky is that they are 85 miles apart from each other. So in a country that's 3,000 miles wide, the highest and lowest points are 85 miles apart. That's pretty quirky. The next few are based upon the shape of the country. So the coastlines aren't directly north-south and the peninsulas don't extend the exact same distance. So there are some kind of, you know, hmm kind of things that, about the latitude and longitude that you might not be aware of. One is if it, you're going to start in San Diego, California, right on the Mexican border, and then drive east on a line of latitude, you'll end up on the east coast in Charleston, South Carolina. I think a lot of folks think that San Diego, you know, being on the border is going to be much further south, maybe as far as Jacksonville, Florida, but no, it's latitude per latitude is right even with Charleston, South Carolina. Similarly, deep south Texas extends almost as far south as south Florida. So most people know Florida from being, you know, subtropical, Miami's way down there, but a lot of folks don't know that deep south Texas extends just about as far. You know, the Mexican border right around Brownsville, you know, you follow on a latitude east, you're going to end up in Miami. So if Florida does extend a little bit further south than that, but south Texas is everywhere as subtropical as south Florida is. And the third kind of quirk based on the shape of the country is that Reno, Nevada is further west than Los Angeles. So you think of Reno, it's up in the mountains, it's near Lake Tahoe, it's pretty far inland. And, you know, Los Angeles is sitting right there on the coast. But, you know, longitude wise, Reno is further west in L.A. My favorite naming oddity in American geography is West St. Paul, Minnesota. And why this is so funny is that it's southeast of St. Paul. And it's not like it's a case where it was originally founded, you know, the historic part of St. Paul was east there and it just it developed west. No, the West St. Paul, when it was founded, it was already south of the historic district of St. Paul and now it's southeast of the city. So from a naming perspective, I think it's pretty hilarious. A couple of placement oddities in the U.S. are that there are two places that are part of U.S. states, but you have to drive through Canada to get to them. One of them is called the Northwest Angle in Minnesota. And this is, you know, an area part of Minnesota, but in order to get there by road, you have to drive through Manitoba to get to it. And the other is Point Roberts, Washington. And in order to get to it by road, you have to drive through British Columbia. It's a lot closer to, you know, Vancouver, much more you know, culturally tied to the British Columbia than it is to Washington. So those are two pretty unique places in the U.S. that are really kind of more Canadian, but they are, you know, under the U.S. jurisdiction. And because I like the word discontiguous, I'm going to use that as a segue into this next quirk, and that is that there are two discontiguous counties in the U.S. Well, one of them is technically a parish in Louisiana, but that's the same as a county. So St. Martin Parish in Louisiana is discontiguous. There are two different parts of it. So in order to stay in that same parish, you have to drive through another one to get to it. And the other one is Norfolk County in Massachusetts, which is suburbs of Boston. So again, to say in Norfolk County, you have to drive through a different county to get to it. So those are the two discontiguous county you know, parishes in the U.S. The next has to do with city and county nomenclature and how that affects jurisdiction. And there are some pretty unique ones in the U.S. Virginia is the only state in the country that has cities and counties that are completely separate jurisdictions. The vast majority of Americans live in a city that is also a part of a county. So, for example, I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is part of Hamilton County. And before that, I lived in Monterey, California, which is part of Monterey County. But in Virginia, things are a lot different. So they'll have a city that is not within a county. So, for example, you have Roanoke. So you can live in a city of Roanoke, 
but you don't live in a county at all. You don't live in Roanoke County. The two are completely separate jurisdictions, and there's no other state that does that. The only other places in the U.S. that do that are St. Louis and Baltimore. So these are two places. There's cities, you know, the city of St. Louis and the city of Baltimore, but they're not part of, you know, St. Louis County or Baltimore County. But this is not something that is statewide with Missouri and Maryland. So again, Virginia is the only one that does that kind of weird thing with cities and counties being separate. And there are four cities in the U.S. that are both cities and counties at the same time. So the jurisdiction is the exact same thing. Those are San Francisco, Philadelphia, Denver, and Broomfield, Colorado. So these four are the city and county. It's the exact same jurisdiction. So the city boundaries are the same as the county boundaries. And these are the only four like this in the U.S. The next has to do with metropolitan areas and how they're defined. And most folks know how the metro area populations are calculated because you can't just say the central city of an area is the entire population because say you live in Atlanta, it's not just Fulton County, it's also Gwinnett and DeKalb and Cobb and Clayton and Forsyth and all the other suburban counties. Or, you know, if you live in Houston, it's, you know, it's not just Harris County, it's also Brazoria and Fort Bend and, you know, Galveston County. So that's how every metropolitan area in the country is calculated. San Diego, California is unique and it's the only metropolitan area with a population greater than 1 million in which the metropolitan area is defined as a singular county. So San Diego County is the San Diego metropolitan area with about 3.1 million people. There are no suburban counties that add on to the metropolitan area in San Diego. The other really unique one is Providence, Rhode Island. It's the only metropolitan area with a population greater than 1 million in which the metropolitan area is a state. So the state of Rhode Island is the Providence metropolitan area, and that's the only one in the country that's like that. And because I love me some segues, I'm going to use a discussion about metropolitan areas to go into my next quirk about Chicago. Think about how big Chicago is. It is huge. It's the third biggest city in the country. Think about the metropolitan area's footprint. I mean, you got Cook County and Lake and DuPage and Will and Kendall and McHenry, and you got the northwestern corner of Indiana and Lake and Porter counties. And it's enormous. There are 9 million people that live in the metropolitan Chicago area. And if you live there, you're like, wow, we live in an enormous city. Because you do. But New York and L.A. are twice as big. So for as big as you think Chicago is at 9 million people, there are over 18 million in L.A. and over 20 million, 20 million in New York. So again, Chicago is huge, but it's way, way, way smaller than either New York or L.A. And I'm going to keep the Segway train rolling as I go on comparing metropolitan areas. I'm going to compare Toronto to American cities. This isn't really a quirk or an oddity. It's just more of an interesting fact. And most people know that Toronto is the biggest city in Canada. The metropolitan area for Toronto is about 5.8 million people. And where would that rank in the U.S.? Well, it would be ninth. So it would just be smaller than the Houston, Galveston Bay metro area and just bigger than the Miami, Fort Lauderdale metro area. So if you're wondering where the biggest city in Canada would rank in the U.S., it would be ninth. One of my favorite ones is based upon signage and topography. And if you've driven in the eastern U.S., you might be very familiar with this one. Interstates 81 and 77 are both north-south oriented interstates that come together in southwestern Virginia and are the same highway for a short stretch. And that's pretty common throughout the U.S. There are portions of Indiana and Ohio where interstates 80 and 90 are the same. And there are portions of Pennsylvania where interstates 70 and 76 are the same. But so that's not unique, but what is unique is in southwestern Virginia, if you're going north on 77, when they merge, you'll be also going south on 81 or vice versa. And when you first see the sign, you're like, what on earth? How is this possible? That, you know, is this some, you know, vandal just making a joke? But it's actually because at this stretch, they're going east-west. So if you're going north on 77, when you hit the interchange, you start going west. If you're going north on I-81, hit, hit the interchange, start going east. So Anyway, I think it's kind of a quirky, you know, feature based on topography, but see those signs, I think it is pretty funny. The last two I wanted to mention are based on physical geography, and I've mentioned both of these in other videos. That's why I wanted to save these for last. The first is that the two biggest earthquakes in U.S. recorded history outside of Alaska have been in Missouri and South Carolina. So you think of the biggest earthquakes, you're going to think of the West Coast first for obvious reasons, but the two biggest ones have been back east. In the 19th century, there were huge earthquakes in the southeastern Missouri and in Charleston, South Carolina. And these places still have a very large earthquake risk, so they have to be careful there. But it's kind of interesting to think that the two biggest earthquakes outside of Alaska have been in Missouri and South Carolina. And the last one that I'm going to mention is just how freaking empty central Nevada is. And, you know, there are so few people that live in just this enormous area. So you can fit the entire state of Maine or South Carolina into this part of central Nevada. And there's a grand total of 100,000 people that live in an entire area. 
actually less than that, really. But you think about how big Maine and South Carolina are. Can you imagine only having 100,000 people in the entire state? So Central Nevada is just an enormous area with very, very few people. So that's my list of geographic oddities and quirks in the U.S. And if such a big country, you're bound to get some strange stuff like this. And some of them, I think, are pretty funny and they're all pretty interesting. But I don't know. I love this country. I love some of the quirks and things that make it so unique. I hope you found the information in this video useful. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve. And if you're interested in stuff about road tripping across the U.S. and some geography stuff and some travel stuff, and consider subscribing to my channel. That's kind of stuff that I'm posting. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King is hunting out and about to take a road trip to North South Carolina.